Welcome everybody to tonight's event. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome you. Um, for the vo those of you who don't know me, I am Eloise Scottford. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Laws and co-director. Tonight I'm here in my capacity, I think, as co-director of, of the Centre for Law and Environment. Um, I'm not sure, we've had a film premiere in the building before, so this is a really special night. Um, and it's all on the back of the um, work of some remarkable people who we've got with us this evening. Our colleague, Alison Lindner, and some terrific people we have online, if you can see it, Pramila and Tricia. I will introduce everybody as well as our chair for the event. Um, we've got two outputs tonight that are super exciting. We'll save the film premiere for a moment, but I wanted to focus first on the, this document that hopefully you've got and that you picked up on the way in. Um, this is one of um, our Faculty of Law's policy briefs. I think it's the second one we've done. Um, and it's all about um, waste pickers and uh, it builds on the extraordinary research that um, Dr. Alison Lindner, our colleague in the Faculty of Laws, um, did for her doctoral research on waste pickers and sustainable development in South Africa. Um, I think it speaks really to the quality of that work that it has spawned these remarkable things that we're seeing and experiencing and can take away this evening, Alison. Really amazing work. Um, and you'll learn lots more about it in the brief and in the film to follow. Um, but it's a, I mean, the kind of the scale of the issue that is picked up in Alison's research and how relevant it is for, for policymakers is why we've put, we've put together this policy brief. Um, she's looking at a, a group of marginalised um, workers in South Africa that pick 90% of everything that's recycled in an industry that's worth a billion pounds um, and who are um, excluded from a role in policy making, uh, who are excluded from the vision of sustainable development in South Africa. And Alison's research has brought this wonderfully to life. Um, the aim of the policy brief is to translate this research that you've done into the policy making sphere um, with, a review, with, with a view to improving economic, social, environmental conditions um, um, in which waste pickers and their beneficiaries live. And this uh, is very much hoped that this will um, be picked up in South Africa and other parts of the global south. Um, I wanted to pay tribute to the team that helped Alison with this work as well. Um, Lucy Shackleton, unfortunately, couldn't be here tonight. She's um, the uh, head of policy and partnerships at the UCL European Institute, who worked with Isra Black, our uh, impact lead, to bring this to life. So it's lovely to see it in hard copy um, and do enjoy reading it. Um, tonight, you're going to see, as I have, say, a film premiere um, that has been in production since, it's a film, Reclaiming Now, that's been in production since September 2021. Alison arrived in the faculty and then promptly went on um, location to shoot this film. I think that's what happened, um, which we all went, okay, yeah, that happens all the time. It does not happen all the time. Okay. It was, and you were so cool and understated. I'm off to film uh, a documentary directed by these wonderful women who we have on screen. Um, and very, you're welcome. Thank you for joining online. We've got lots of people in the room who are very excited about um, watching your film. So these are the directors, Pramila Murcott, Trisha Halongwa, um, and they worked with Alison um, to translate her PhD thesis into this widely accessible medium. I'm not gonna say too much more other than that we're all really excited. We've been hearing bits and bobs about in the faculty and, and providing as much support as we can and have been really, really happy to do that. Um, my job now is to hand over to the chair, um, Dr. Bersha Odadar, who's a lecturer in climate change and environmental law at SOAS. Um, at the, and his work focuses on environmental and climate justice, human rights, climate litigation and water law, with a regional focus on South Asia. South Asia. Um, and before academia, Bersha practiced environmental law at law firms and NGOs. Um, and you're very welcome back at UCL Law Special. Thanks a lot, Eloise, and welcome everyone. Um, <clears throat> so it's really my honor to chair this um, documentary and Q&A session. Um, I've known Alison for a number of years now um, before either of us had actually started our PhDs. So it's really 
uh, fantastic and uh, to see the fruition of her work um, today through the medium of this documentary. So I'll speak a little bit about the documentary or just briefly introduce it, introduce the speakers um, and some uh, sort of housekeeping points and then we will begin the documentary. So Reclaiming Now is a documentary about waste pickers in South Africa and their struggle to enjoy social and economic dimensions of sustainable development as promised in the South African constitution. Directed by um, Pramila Murcott and Trisha Halongwa, the documentary is the brainchild of Alison here, who's an interdisciplinary scholar at UCL. Um, as Eloise has also already kind of elaborated, it kind of translates her PhD thesis um, into these findings um, into a widely accessible um, medium. Um, she, her work translates these international legal ideas such as sustainable development that shape the lives of the most vulnerable among us. Um, in this case, waste pickers in South Africa. It's found that the lived reality of sustainable development does not really accord with this concept. Waste pickers work hard to collect and sell recyclable materials. Um, and they do this for a meager living while saving South African municipalities, businesses, um, and the wider environment um, millions of rand per year. Yet they face multiple challenges um, realizing economic and social development in South Africa, the country um, called one of the uh, called the most unequal society um, in the world by the World Bank. Essentially, waste pickers are guaranteed a right to sustainable development according to the South African Constitution, but this right is not realized. They continue to live in poverty with little opportunity to move into any formal sector, and so the film will really appeal. Um, to policymakers, waste pickers and their allies, households, activists, academics, and anyone else interested in the environment, informal economy, um, human rights, sustainable development. So to introduce the, the um, uh, three, three people um, beside me or online, um, firstly, Dr. Alison Linda is lecturer at UCL um, in, the, in the Faculty of Law. Um, Alison uses economic and socio-legal approaches to research waste, sustainable development, and the informal economy. She also runs a waste law reading group um, for early career researchers and a legal, as she worked as a legal researcher before becoming an academic. Um, this is Alison's first film, maybe not last. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> um, and then um, our two guests online. Um, so we have Pramila Murcott, who has over 10 years of experience editing documentaries and TV shows. She was one of the editors working on The Time of Pandemics, a film um, that was broadcast in Al Jazeera. And, 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 and with the South African Broadcasting Corporation. Um, in 2019, she worked as an editor on the award-winning film How to Steal a Country in, in 2021. She won an award at the Canadian Labour International Film Festival for her documentary entitled Street Traders on the Move. And lastly, Trisha Longwa has over a decade of experience in documentary, film, and top television shows, including the South African Broadcasting Corporation, BBC, and Al Jazeera. She's a social impact content producer and director focusing on issues of human rights, land rights, participatory democracy, and the environment. Um, Trisha has worked alongside international journalists such as Redi Talabi, Zainab Badawi, and Emmy award-winning documentary director Rehad Desai. Her work is anchored in the theme of rights and responsibilities. So that's our three um, panelists today. Um, so just to say the film is exactly 48 minutes, um, followed by a Q&A at the end. And I think we'll be kicked out of the room at 7.45. So that's probably, um, that's, that's when we will end. Um, we have online an online audience as well. Yep. Um, and we have uh, Zulu and Kosa ex interpreters on hand to take any questions online and in person. Um, the event is also recorded and will be viewed um, or screened at a later date as well. Uh, so thank you very much. And I think we can begin. Thank you. Thank you.
like all like fun as a car. Uzopum Televans, the local and Pupu Sugar. Not in Monon Pum, Nina Shad. Shooting also with my lengthy tola, Yogans and Lambaway, ninety rand, among other good Ninganyan. Among other good man, fifty rand in Buyana. Shooting Funa Abbas Gluban Bafoon. Bafundi. Mfuna enze ni mtu manga bese ese kati diskolo. Abe yi ni noma bo tishela, noma abe yi yonke nje msebe nzish. Aufuna yo ye ni kizweni yake. Mina mfundi isi. Ushuti je ye na yabona njina nga nkulmela ngayi mzukuti mkhole ye kumwa. Iyona ande zoba ngono. Iyona ande zoba ngono. Wooding Hall is over right. Hall in Pesci. No good, nine to lend a young patagat soon or Bashana now. It's why now I cook. Woody Bang, I told him quite good. You're not a young patagat soon, born moon to be sharp and warm your bottle. I was like, I'm going to go to the Into into the bad legal actually safety arm. Into a bad legging of his was also one can I go go come and feel into a seven and seven seconds and go to a safety one. When man have been peeling, I've been peeling, we and peeling. So among about two is the message and a little talk on to Bule Guabanzani. I vagalica good and go about Basubi, then about our Espazi, and I buy a foot to see for Miss Ogamba now. Sit Massi Pumla. The Pum, the song, the Slade Pans, the singers, and no was an as we say, our purposes no way, the season over the singers, and no was an singer, and Namaka, my foot and Vengo, was this proper Pumla, no mere Sadia Kitola, and by a pair called Singers. My name is Allison, and I study waste, sustainable development, and the informal economy. I started this project on waste reclaimers and sustainable development in 2015, and now I'm making a documentary about it. Getting to grips with the day-to-day -day experiences of reclaimers and learning more about their understanding of sustainable development. Them, uh, want to sort with me? Eh? Yeah. So, oh, okay. what is this? This what one is... is the pet. Pet. That one is pet. It's okay. A, we, 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 like we're differentiating on, on it to show that it is pet. It is, okay. This one is a clear one. So, because there's some of them are blue and a green. Okay. 
So, and so, then you've got some other then, materials. Uh, this is... Easy. That one, I also put it on this. I used to say it is a starter pack. Yeah, <laughs> yeah even when, pack. Yeah, when we, when, we, when we said it, we said it like that. We say it's a starter pack. Okay, <laughs> yes. okay. But I yeah. put it in, in yes, here. Yes, you put it okay. in here. So uh, when I... When I I, I separate this one. Okay. Uh, we eat also I'll take it out for because it's paying its own price. Okay. Not the same as cable. Yeah. Oh, you're not crushing like that. Yeah, okay. I decided to focus on South Africa primarily because sustainable development is a guaranteed right, and that basically means that uh, people who live in South Africa have the right to um, enjoy a protected environment and. In improved social and economic conditions. And I tried to marry that with my studies on the informal economy. And what I noticed is that um, while waste pickers were really improving the environment, it's been well documented how um, much savings they make for municipalities around South Africa, millions of rands every year, um, they were not enjoying improved economic and social conditions. And so I did my field work on this, my thesis on this topic in order to understand some of the reasons behind why it was that they were making such an, an amazing contribution to um, la like extending the, the use of landfills, keeping cities clean, but yet many of these people were living in poverty. Uh, I think 2007, yeah, 2007, and was grade 12 for So, and then you to do OPG for what to impede with him climbing up as of the Pambi, but definitely so Kagunga, Kwang E. Maria in Yakova, Kushiranjalo, because Umzale and I, the only parent in I, Ku Mam, and the Sabinza E. domestic worker. While I was still working in the online classes, I was in academy. tourism, tourism and hospitality management. I was in the Indian city, I the they tell me when we go on tourism, man, we tourism. I want to go and get the license, the get the license, get the license. He we caught fourteen million. I'm been go go. And they zang and been I in class. Yeah, um, seven slow with old private track. We party a lapa we reclaim a nakona ge bending track assistance. We be in Gong to Cuba in a corner, we've been Cuba footed in like Cuba Gago say, Nasin Lena, Yaksum, and so on to the Ongan Oban and Mark and Banang like drive. I would drive by into Yam. I would drive by into Yam, any truck driver. Landing as a Zbang of Ankalinga, imagine the Madding Eco, Namding as civilians. The one my in play that is a Bangono, is a Bangono Gayo Kum, Kungaba. So When I visited South Africa five years ago to carry out research for my PhD, I interviewed Wilson, a reclaimer who began recycling waste over 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. 
mile go riale ke kre le mmere kwa recycling bo ke shumang ka wona ke eta ke topella di 2 liter di plastic di polypropa o riale le matraire ka moka ke tsona tshe ke iphirisang ka tsona o tswa mathomo ne ha ka a ke thoma mmere kwa recycling ne ke feletswe ke mmere ko mo di contracting e ka 99 ka thoma o ga re ka mmere kwa recycling mara e no ba fela o topa mola le mola o fetela bile ke tswaela e go topa mmere kwa recycling and then moho 2001 ke ha ke thoma o ba fast bjalo mo mmere kwa kwa recycling mo pitore re bere ka re le batho ba le sume 10 ka mo ha ra yona tshelete ya ne e bang gona re gona o tsira tshelete le kana ngo e re kisitse e gona o dira me something 5000 but right share ka re re 10 mo go yona re gona o dira re tsire bro tshonya na ka mo ha ka yona e How do you see the work of reclaimers in terms of protecting the planet and fighting climate change? We've saved a lot of spaces from landfills. Mm -hmm. And again, I'll talk about Averda. It has more than 300 reclaimers inside, on site. The reclaimer will collect around two to 300 kg a day. 300 kg a day, yes. wow, that's amazing. Then there are other material that they take out immediately to go and sell so that they can get food, they can get. Mm -hmm. So it become more than that, what they collecting. Mm -hmm. And in five years time, we don't want to work for buyback centers. Okay. Now we want to run our own entity. We want to go and recycle with our own trucks, mm -hmm. then come back yeah. and sell to the bigger fishes, we call them like that. Okay. That mm -hmm. means mm -hmm. where the end product is, yeah. not to the buyback centers that are giving mm -hmm. us half the price of what they are getting. Okay. Uh, the price is fast. Harry Lord Regisa, Okra sometimes, two liter PT, I get Regisa, but it's like a three fifth. Yeah, go in between in some aspala, Harcopa and Lebon. Bavulel, Ravulel, Lebon, Harcopa, and Reven Trey one. Or a Bagar two, Sakam Mercore, Recre. You play it over again. But, but slowly, I don't care if I play it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. Zuela Tini Sono is one of the founders of the Waste Collection Community Associations, an organization that is working hard to professionalize the work done by reclaimers and other waste management practitioners. Non-regulation of this sector has let it be a doggy dog world where it's now a survival for the fittest. Yeah. And just on that note, women who are in reclaiming they're in danger, most of them. I know cases of women who have been raped okay. while reclaiming. Uh, I know women whose reclaiming recyclable products have been taken while they were on their way to selling because they were working alone, and they've got nobody to report. But because nobody's identifiable and everybody meets in the road, then you don't know who even robbed you. You don't even know what to report, but yeah. also, even if somebody steals your recyclables, mm -hmm. if you don't know the value of what you were carrying, how do you open a case, mm. you know? And it leads me to just an example where in the management of reclaimer problems, where reclaimers, as I said, at some point, they are a cost 
to the environment where they are living in rivers, they are separating mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. they are separating in parks. Mm -hmm. So the environmental damage that they are living, it's worse than the contribution that they were actually making. Okay. So they mm -hmm. also need to be educated yeah. and to be given uh, a hearing. Mm -hmm. But we need to start creating sorting points mm -hmm. where they can go and sit and sort uh, legally. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to improve the bylaws that is going to allow them to carry certain amounts, create uh, storage places, because part of the issue is nobody's licensed to be a waste picker. So sustainable development, you may already be aware, um, is enshrined in the South African Constitution. Mm -hmm. um, Section 24B3 mm -hmm. says that everyone in South Africa has the right to an ecologically sustainable um, environment. Mm -hmm. um, and that must be done with regards to in economic justice and social development. Is there any scope for reclaimers to enjoy what's in the constitution? Yes, there is. Um, <laughs> economic justice simply means, for me, your participation must bring back the economic enjoyment that you expect from your labor contribution. Is that happening for reclaimers? No. Is it possible to happen? Yes, it is possible to happen if they are recognized as low end waste managers that are going to work with producers. Work with producers, not work for producers. Meaning, we must therefore require uh, from producers a certain element of formalization of sorting and collection functionalities that collect their items. Cook should have their own recycling center. Why not? Uh, Woolworth, I mean, they are one of the biggest producers of one-use plastic. The formalization of reclaimers must also mean capacitating them by giving them the correct tools to operate so that even when they become cooperatives, they get licenses, they must get legal sites, yeah. uh, and they must also get proper transportation mm -hmm. assistance yeah. from the city through its pick it up system yeah. uh, to take their resources where they are sellable. People are now coming in numbers wanted to register. We've traveled Cape Town, East London, even here in Joburg. It's still going to open more complexes where reclaimers were not allowed because people think that you know, they are drug addicts, they are dealers, or they are thieves. It's really going to help them because okay. they will know that the people that we thought mm -hmm. they are nothing, yeah. but they are something in life. Okay. And they are doing a great job in order to clean the areas okay. because that's what we wanted from the government recognize us, mm -hmm. talk with us, mm -hmm. and in everything that you do, decision making, bring us in so that we can help you to make the right decision concerning reclaimers, because we are the reclaimers, mm -hmm. so we are the ones who knows what to do yeah. and what we need, mm -hmm. not you thinking that what we need. So when I was doing my field research, I asked everyone I interviewed, what does sustainable development mean to you? And often waste reclaimers had never heard of the term, but I did come across a waste reclaimer who had a degree in risk management. And he said to me that for him, sustainable development meant slow growth. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? And he meant, well, it means economic growth, economic development, but it must be done in a way that respects the environment and that also makes sure that the people who are working towards this economic development um, are paid well and have good social conditions. Uh, my role is uh, by making sure that the ecosystem is running very well. You see, if we leave the, the, the 30 all over, 
it is going to kill every kind of the plants. In, uh, some of the things they are poisonous, some of the things acidity, so they are killing the environment. Uh, we are reducing the pl pollution on the, on the like, or even on this, uh, you can say on the city. People like waste reclaimers or um, people working in the waste management, in the wider waste management economy, I don't think they necessarily need to know what sustainable development is, but they certainly need to benefit from it because it is, yes, it is an aspiration, but it is something that can work if um, people in the economy, you know, the government, uh, private sector, third sector work together to see different ways in which everyone can improve uh, the environment and improve the livelihoods of people who are vulnerable and doing really important work. Government Elohani ka se khone o dira America. E ka o khona ha e kopane le reng. Re le compare. Eh, ha re beka re beka ka o fela re le tshuke. Le government e ka khone. But le rena re le wan Government government So when I was a child, um, I'm from South America, Guyana, the only English-speaking country in South America. My cousin and I would play a little, little game with my mother, which was to pick up all the bottles in the yard and give it to men who would come by, and they would then take it to a recycle depot and earn money from that. Um, so anyone could have taken those bottles. We could have taken them to the bottle company, but my mum said, you know, if these men need the money, that it makes more sense for us to give them the bottles and let them earn something. So when I started my undergraduate degree, um, a professor of mine suggested that I study something that other people hadn't been studying, and I came across these waste pickers, and so I started reading about them quite a lot. Um, so I've looked at waste pickers in Nigeria, in Vietnam, in Brazil, um, in India. So I think when I was a child, I wasn't really aware of all of the, the nuance of the industry and all of the different factors, the circular economy around recycling. Um, I think it's different for different waste pickers around the world. So I think in some parts of the world, they're very active politically, certainly in Latin America. They have been very active, very um, at the forefront of asserting their rights. Um, and that is something that's only, I think, growing, like it, it's there in South Africa, but it's, it's growing more and more. non recyclable uh, Zimba chips packets. Nobody's buying this. This is not recyclable. And it's a lot of it. You can imagine how many households are buying Omo, are buying soap, are buying milk, uh, if they only knew, if they only knew where their waste end up. The law does not include the waste managers that are waste pickers as part of the regulations. So they are already left behind. It is only uh, a word that has been created by the industry to recognize the participation of waste pickers in the industry. And it still says informal. There is nothing informal about waste management. It is just at what level do you participate. Johannesburg is an example. It is simply that the value of service provision has collapsed from high end to the lowest level, to a point where there is too much to collect, which has fallen out of the system, and people think that is an industry. That's not an industry. That is evidence of a mismanagement of waste program in the city 
or in South Africa as a whole. The original city planning was not for the population that currently resides in the city. And the re residents in the city allocate themselves where they live based on affordability. And therefore, it means there is no common approach to waste management over the city. For example, in the middle of the city, there is garden sites, which means you can take your rubble, waste, and then you, you leave it there, other than on collection days. In Soweto, there's none. In uh, areas where there are shacks, there's no such service. Uh, that's why when you pass by each and every shack area, you find dumping sites alongside the roads. It's because this service is not provided. That's why we've got so many dumping areas that become infectious, hazardous, and then it becomes an environmental problem where you can't recover the waste and you also can't clean the area because it's just become a new event. Also, the issue of landfills. Reclaimers now live in landfills. It's wrong. It, it means there's no management of landfills at all because nobody is supposed to be inside a landfill. It's hazardous already. But if you go to all the landfills in the city of Johannesburg, Pretoria, everywhere, you'll find people inside. No safety, no. So it's an industry, as I'm saying, that is being created from mismanagement. And the mismanagement of that program of waste management in South Africa has created a business enterprises that operate without regulation. In many developing countries, there may be a well-developed legal framework, but there may not be a well-developed infrastructure to do recycling. I think that waste reclaimers perform a very important function, while at the same time protecting the environment and keeping the environment clean. So I think that's really important. In more developed societies, there may not be as many waste reclaimers because there is a well-developed framework where the municipality will collect waste every day and also there's less poverty generally so people have better access to formalized jobs in a range of sectors. My experience of people who work in this field is that many of them do this job as a last resort. Um, so people do not wake up in the morning and say, I would like to be a waste reclaimer. They may have a degree, they may have um, another skill, and for some reason they have lost their job or they just haven't been able to gain work in, in the field that they would like to, and so often they end up doing this job. I'm holding a BA in Humanities, majoring in History and Development Studies. Um, I'm also holding a BA, Honours in Gender Studies. I'm going to go to the school. 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 I'm going to go Zotatanganisenani, <laughs> So 
Ngazi malunge lo tina skules ngazi nala malunge lo ti ninte shine fana na ninte fana na ninte ngazi zonge le zozindoles skules je singa waza malunge lo ti ni ma anje ke singa abona kuto guraiti guraiti je gonge sh ngo nzaga la tina skules ngazi lo tonga malunge I'm going to go to the Overriding will be fits of Zami, those ends and a low man lay. Those ends. You want to say, Connala? Connala? God and your man, you want to say, Connoisseur, you troll, and so I told you, Stad. And again, no man, a poor man is singing at Lala and says, What told? And says, What told? Walk so well and three, three, four. In all as this way, Coopook. As this way, Coop was this or Galang or Nile first tail. Mang Lumus and a first tail. Sing a bone with no man a puma get fine and says of taller loot. What are you minding a puma manch? A second lootings of toll. Sebeco shield and was a yonky, Sebeco shall yonky in Dow. Banning a bandas of a cosham a potley. Banning Banning a cool. Oxuti logo kutalo yin kutalo kuti sebe boni langit ngoba ilana imi na ba bona ngamu inkoshala mapole langit belo be buzagi me nang ba chelak teng bona ngabona masaga se kuli onki da na mingeng be na umo noa na boba ya ba ikoshala benzela ini toli mal toli mal ngala mapole ngeng be na umo na na lo. Who writes his tosha song is Leo Kualang, a little scattered Kualang as his sack. I was staying with her last year, last year and last of last year. They were staying there, but now the boys say, "No, I, I want to go. I want to come with you in Jobek." So now he is here. So he is left alone with, like sitting alone at home. She is alone. I know by Zizi ndoze akakata kakulu laki ugu lima gali inyo kakulu.
and uh, impuyo like ukufuya izi ndo za inde ziza ama livestock nje ngokubona nalapha ka yena zinkukhu zikhona and like izi ninzi nje kwani namkedlela endi zibona ngayo ngoba nje kwani ndizibonile azaka buyi zonke anzasa ukuthi zingabi this pumpkin no but you cannot give us this one <laughs> She said, yeah, I cannot give you this one. It's the only one that is, is here. So it's like maybe she's still waiting for it to grow big. You see how big it is now. But it still needs it to be grow big. The young society up. In this agency, I saw him doing at the club again. In this agency, I I cook and gargle and I show you on the corner. Go to I so in the I cook and gargle about the bandings. Our savings. Nabi was drinking. So the consumers are sick. I was in the way to in the way that he isn't to Zamba and wing. That is our robot. <laughs> because if you are not shaking them, you will get hit of them or get them. A cake sleeping on the road while you are driving fast. Got input going in, getting at me full reborn as you do development. We don't have pins where we can put it to Remember, Connor, you hold you hold the abas of Faga with you so I'm a recyclable. See how I see how I'm bail as how Tiki hold. It's a good as calling. There's a calling a white paper, a boxy, nazi, zindu, zongazo zindu, nazo zi, tizual a pesco tin, fagum lilus. If the hole is full. We, oh, we, we take the other one, we close this one, we're using the other one, so we keep on changing the places of dumping, like digging hole, we dig hole. Or if we see, we can see that we can pen them, we just pen them here. We are not taking them as, like, to recycle them. Yeah. Okay. Huh? Right up. All this money, money, money coming to me. No handouts, I really had to do it for me. Watch me work. Watch me work. Watch me work. Get out the dirt. All this money, money, money coming to me. No handouts, I really had to do it for me. Watch me work. Watch me work. Watch me work. You ain't hit her, but you never gonna stop me. Yellow clout, really can't block me. Pipe down like a D appointment. I'm high class and you're just real annoying. Cutting people off like in traffic. Some say it's black girl magic. Some got it and some just have it. Known to give old school vibes like classics. Work hard, my dream can't snatch it. Homegrown, this kid ain't plastic. If you want a girl, you can have it. Never judge how you go and get it. Everybody blueprint different. Like I'm trying to heal some children. Let them know never hide their feelings. They can make it and reach past ceilings. <laughs> Because I'm doing e-recycling, ne? there is other sister that is from Okumbu, that side of us, but is, is, is my, my home sister. Ne? She recognized that, no, this guy should have uh, found the job. 
because you see how many children I have. You see how many children that comes out from my house. Yes, that's what she noticed about me. She, she said, no, we have a lot of children. I, I, I have to provide for the whole family. So she said, no, let me take you because I want to quit. She was working, well, she was working here, but she said, no, I'm feeling tired and uh, now I, I want to resign from them. But when I say to, to them, to our, my bosses, I want to resign, they say, I must get someone to, to come in. So she just pointed at me, I say, good luck. Same time I started working like as, as, uh, as I'm working now. And I'm very, I'm very proud of, of, of the, this, what I'm doing, because now I'm getting the salary after the end of the day, I'm getting the salary, I can budget, I can do something like, uh, something good for myself with this budget, because I know that I will get sort of my amount like this at the end of the day. While I was doing it myself, I can collect and I say, yeah, I want to get 5,000. Instead of 5,000, 1.5. When I'm doing like this, certain amount I will get, I am sure about. Recycling for myself only, I cannot get enough to provide for the family. Because I used to wake up early, like like four, half past four, I go out and uh, I needed to reach those places that I used to work in time. For now, I just wake up on my time. By six, I can wake up now, six and uh, starting preparing myself. So my life has changed a lot because I used to come back very tired, very, very tired because we make our bags full. So for me to come back, hey, I will struggle a lot, but I'll, I'll, get, I'll get home, but get tired. So for me now, because I'm not going around like in so many places, I just come and uh, collect the things here and the other restaurant up there and this one also, I collect. And that room also, that room, uh, they just put the things there the recyclables, because it's the room for the recyclables. So those that they collected, like around the residence around here, so they just put it there, and then I have the keys, I can go and open, and I take those things and come and sort here. That's my task to, to make sure that it is open, it is clean, and I maintain it right. The general view is that South Africa has got a wonderful constitution. But wonderful in paper does not mean wonderful in reality. Sometimes it's where you are staying or where you are living that makes uh, the difference in how you are impacted in the environment. All the dumps or landfills in the city were originally placed in areas where there were no population closer to it. But because of population growth, you go to Soweto, people of Soweto, Devland, uh, Freedom Park, they are basically sitting around the landfill. My ideal was, would be for there to be no more recycling. Um, now stay with me. So what I mean by that is that I think society has to get to the point where we make things, if you're going to make new things, that don't need to be recycled. We make things that can be used for 50 years, 100 years. Um, also, we make things where we already foresee how they may be used in the future. So we think about ways in which they can be reused. Um, if they're going to be recycled, um, we, we already have envisaged in the first design of the product what those supplementary or secondary products or tertiary products are so that everything isn't done in a kind of fast fashion or um, short-sighted way, but it's done for the long game. I think that for me is, is the future. Fact is, we are all impacted by the environment. Fact is, global warming is affecting everyone. Block drains have killed people in Johannesburg simply because waste is everywhere and is not managed. So the consequences 
of mismanagement environmentally are already being felt at different levels and we feel that as reclaimers already just the fact that there is no safety net just the fact that uh, citizens have got no responsibility should they throw a needle or something that is poisonous inside a dustbin and a reclaimer happens to pick it up and it pierces them and it infects them there will be no consequences uh, it means we are living at a different level of life we are not part of what society is about we are just the brooms that are used to sweep uh, so that the areas are clean i hope that my research does has have an impact it helps people who i work with my students to be more conscious of waste, be more conscious of recycling, be more conscious of when they buy something, do they really need it? Is it of a good enough quality that it can last for a long time? You know, so I want people to think differently about waste and reuse and, and, and products because five or 600 years ago, we didn't have inorganic waste. It's a relatively new phenomenon. And at the moment, there's more inorganic matter on earth than there is organic matter. So that for me is really worrying. And so I really want people around the world to understand that waste is, you know, it's here to stay, but and that means that we need to be conscious of how much of it that we're producing and how can we produce less and eventually no more. Okay, thank you um, very much. Um, I hope you enjoyed the documentary as much as I did. Uh, really, um, yeah, for me, the personal stories, the narrative uh, that was kept around the different aspects of sustainable development, the stunning visuals, um, Alison jumping on like a trampoline on the <laughs> thing. Those are my favorite bits. It's how they compress the waste yeah. to where they sell it. <laughs> and the pictures of you when you were young as well. Mm, okay. um, we have uh, how much time? We have about 45 minutes, actually, just under 45 minutes for questions. So I've got lots of questions, but I'm going to save them and put them in between. Um, we open the floor up. Um, so questions can be put to Alison or um, our guests who are um, there online. Um, and do I take the online questions? Oh, yeah. Please? Yeah. And if there are online questions, please feel free to put them in the chat as well. There is already one, but we'll just wait for questions from the floor. So um, I think we'll take two or three at a time. So yeah. Hi, well, thanks for your big conversation. Really loved it. Great impressive work. So, so more of a two question. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I loved it. And more of a two for question. First of all, have you noticed in your research whether or not there are like human rights NGOs that are pushing and lobbying the government to change uh, the situation? And second of all, do you think it's realistic that they're going to be included in the official waste management system and if so do you think that's really improve their social and economic protection excellent um is there any um perhaps one more question to them uh yep Thank you. It follows on very much from the, the last question. It, it's how the sector could be formalized, um, although I n note that in there not to use that word, um, without removing an income stream from the most vulnerable um, and what parallels to the gig economy in the UK uh, could be drawn. Mm. Excellent. I think that's a good uh, starting point for our yeah. discussion. <laughs> um, 
Should we start with you, Alison, and okay. then if others have? Yeah. yeah. So the first question about um, am I? I think I muted myself. Can I? Am I good now? Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, there is a lot of NGO involvement. I mean, there's a whole network of NGOs across the world that do work with waste pickers and waste picker organizations to um, help formalize them and get you know uh, kind of amplify their voices in front of policymakers. So there is a really active group of um, NGOs in, in South Africa that, that are doing that um, to answer that question. Will formalizing help? That's a good question. Um, it depends on how it's done. There's no prescriptive way that you can't say this is the way to formalize because in it, the, the, the models of formalization that happen in different parts of the world look different and that's because the priorities are different of the people there. Um, you know, so in some parts of the world, they may follow, you know, there's four, you know, four different um, theories of formalization at the moment. Let me get, get too technical into that, but, um, or get into that sort of technical discussion, but it really depends on, on what method they, they decide to, to take when it comes to that. And I had another question over here. I think that was also about formalization. Could you repeat it, please? Definitely. It's just Building on those risks yeah. um, of the, the it, building on the risks of um, formalizing and taking it away from the most vulnerable elements in the community. So building on the risks of formalization and how it will affect the most vulnerable, or so we, I'm saw, to... we saw the example of um, s people who are using it to supplement income yeah. and, and, and come in. And I know there's examples around the world where, for example, your your last contributor who moved to that more formal salaried mm -hmm. system, yeah. but then that excludes the likes of the the mother who who couldn't come. So I just wondered what your learnings were. Wait, the likes of wh which mother? Sorry. Um, the the lady uh, in yeah, oh. who who had many kids was collecting mm -hmm. the bottles. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, but she could do that to fit in and around her circumstances. Yeah. If it wasn't right for her to go out that day, she she didn't. Uh -huh. um, whereas when you do move it to a more formalized okay. um, one, where it becomes salaries or there's greater rights, yeah. it takes away from there that that element. So I just wondered any yeah. learnings. So I guess on that point, so you could strictly say that Sia in his current role is no longer a waste picker. So he is a salaried employee of. Um, a particular company that works in the waste management sector. So that's that's slightly different from like the formalization of waste picking, which might take the form of um, a, a single waste picker filling out the forms that they need to in order to become formalized, or a group of people coming together to form a cooperative and then also filling out lots of paperwork. It's, it's quite, can be quite onerous. Um, I don't know if that helps answer your question in terms of like, you know, so he's not, he's technically no, like he will probably always think of himself as a waste picker in that role, but he may not necessarily be considered one, strictly speaking. Um, and then you had a question around parallels with the gig economy. I think, so there's a lot of themes around informality, um, both in the global south and the global north. And we often don't think about, you know, like informality in the global north, but certainly there is. Um, informality that happens here it has a slightly different character um, in the sense that it it could be something like a zero hour contract <laughs> you know um, but yeah there are parallels in terms of um, not having regular income um, you know not having kind of work benefits um, and then having maybe to you know there's it's kind of easy an entry exit to the different to that sector, if you think of people who work in the gig economy, they can easily, you know, if you've got a bike, you can be a delivery um, person. Um, whereas, you know, and the same for waste pickers in South Africa or anywhere in the world, it's quite easy to just enter the economy and leave it, ex exit and entry is quite easy. So there are certain parallels, but they also look different when we, when we see them in operation. Um, and that just simply has to do with the, the context in which it's happening. Yeah, I wanted to bring in, um, I guess, online, um, Pramila or um, Trisha, did you have any comments on perhaps um, 
yeah, formalization of waste in, in, um, of informal um, waste pickers in South Africa um, from the questions that were posed, um, mm -hmm. challenges that in, in that process in South Africa. Um, um, yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for including us here and just uh, thanks to everyone for coming through and watching our work. Um, I think uh, what we noticed uh, while we're working with uh, certain organizations is that most of the time also uh, what what contributes to, to the work not being so formal is because um, I think at least even half of the people who are working as waste reclaimers are not even legal in South Africa to, to uh, even begin with. So uh, there's a certain fear of uh, can I register myself as a, as a waste reclaimer, even though um, organizations like Arrow and Wigo are in the process of, of trying to um, work with government, um, you know, uh, get the regulations, get, the, get themselves uh, formalized. But um, there is, of course, a fear of um, what about those who are, um, you know, reclaimers but are not uh, legal in South Africa to uh, even begin with. So uh, there's conversations, conversations like um, around that uh, that are happening. But uh, yeah, certainly, uh, Ellison was right. Uh, there is, you know, uh, many uh, various organizations trying to, um, you know, get their voices heard and, uh, and are trying to approach for uh, recognition and appreciation. Uh, but, but, but also, you know, uh, just looking into the South African context, um, a lot of our economy is already in, informal to begin with. So uh, there's, there's just also a bit of that going on, uh, yeah. And then also just to add on, so there are a lot of really great collaborations happening between academia, NGOs, um, reclaimers organizations, and you know other stakeholders. So one of the things we found out about from Sia, but we weren't able to include um, due to timing, but he recently did training in um, dealing with e-waste mm -hmm. and um, learning. He was given an actual physical toolbox and the skills to fix a lot of different appliances. Mm -hmm. And um, you know they are looking. Uh, the waste pickers are being. You know there's a spotlight on a lot of the waste pickers and members of organizations who are working really hard and show good work ethic and potential and training opportunities are being made available for them to get more skills. And people like Azweli um, and the organization he's working with, you know, they are doing a lot of um, work with Pick It Up, organizing transport of waste through the city's um, Pick It Up um, you know, system um, for, for moving waste around and making sure more of it can get recycled um, and sorted before going to a landfill. So there are those things that are happening. So I feel that it would be good um, in terms of policy, if any policy can, you know, encourage what's the good things that are happening on the ground for more of that to happen and for those type of projects to be um, given more support and you know to leverage on the successes that we've seen already in the past few years in particular yeah thank you more questions yep thank you and congratulations on the film it was terrific so one of the issues was obviously to do with the relationship between the pickers and the aggregators the people and whether or not the um, people at the collection centers are returning enough of the economic value of the waste mm -hmm. to the waste pickers. Mm -hmm. Are there any examples, and that's obviously an issue to do with bargaining power. Mm -hmm. Are there any uh, examples of collectivization amongst um, uh, waste pickers in negotiations with those aggregators that have improved um, outcomes for them? Excellent. Um, yeah, question on collectivization. Any other, uh, one more question perhaps? Um, Thank you for the film, it was really great. Um, my question is more about the concept of sustainable development being codified in the constitution. Mm -hmm. I can't quite remember the wording. I think that's really fascinating. Do you have any examples of how it's been applied in practice, just in the everyday laws or how has it been used? With race pickers specifically or? Just in general, really, okay. I'm just interested by the concept, yeah. Okay. Excellent. So we'll throw those um, questions. Mm -hmm. Start with you again, Alison. Okay. All right. The um, no first one and the second one. Just one. Um, 
I'll take your question first, and then I'll answer yours um, second, Michael. Um, so the first, so the second question was around sustainable development and practice. So there is a growing body of ju uh, like jurisprudence around um, the use of sustainable development in court cases, and it being recognised as a as a kind of one of the guaranteed rights under the Bill of Rights in, in the South African Constitution. Um, so in terms of in practice, I can think of there's one agricultural case um, where it was used. Um, not, I, I, can't, I can't give you too many examples off the top of my head right now because um, I think I'm focused very much on waste, waste management. But um, yeah, there are examples. And, and so in the jurisprudence, what South African judges have done is draw an international jurisprudence. They've looked to the international courts of justice um, the European Court of Justice, other jurisdictions to see what they how they've been using um sustainable development in um in their jurisprudence. And that's mainly because um and this happens with lots of other constitutional um rights. The South African constitution has only been around since 1996. Mm -hmm. So it's has got a relatively short lifespan. Um I guess you could say the constitutions do change every kind of 30 years or so. But there isn't a very well developed kind of um, jurisprudence around that. But they have been drawing from other juris jurisdictions. Um, so the second, so the first question I got, the the other question about um, relationships between waste pickers and aggregators. So it's in my experience, those waste pickers who are um, collectivized, as you say, so those who are in cooperatives, will definitely be able to negotiate a better price with an aggregator. And that's simply because there's more of them to um, assert their rights and, and you know check and see. So some, you know, sometimes you're you're scaling or you're um, they might be weighing the, the waste. Um, and if you've only got one person, then you know it's my word against yours in terms of how much is on that is being weighed. Whereas if you've got five people who are you know saying, oh, but we can all see that it's this amount, then it makes a difference um also because um if they're in a collective um then they're formalized so they're still considered part of the informal economy but they've um complied with all of the um legal requirements to to be a kind of waste um <clears throat> collector um and so that base that puts them in a it gives them a bit more respect so it means that when aggregators do interact with them they're more likely to not want to undercut them because they know that these people are in compliance and that they do have a pathway. You know, they can go to the municipality or they can complain or, you know, they can have um, just a bit more negotiating power. So, mm -hmm. yes, it, um, being being in a collective is certainly, you know, better for waste pickers in that regard. And, uh, yeah, perhaps Tricia and... Um... Pramila, um, any <coughs> comments as well to add to that on um, collectivization or on um, sustainable development um, uh, yeah, jurisprudence of sustainability? Um, I think just to assist uh, Alison there, I think uh, the case she, she was referring to was a Kolobeni community uh, in the Eastern Cape where CIA comes from. Uh, well, not there exactly, but in the same province. Uh, so, so they use the environmental clause as uh, part of of their fight against the Minister of Education when they wanted to do a um, um, mining prospect. It was an Australian company uh, that, that wanted to, um, you know, uh, see if there's gas or something in that area, but they but they use, you know, environmental clauses uh, to uh, fight the case. And um, currently, right now, uh, maybe from, from what I can speak to is um, uh, there's, there's a climate change um, organizations yeah, um, African yeah. Climate Alliance. Yeah. And um, there's a case around deadly air and, you know, using fossil fuel and the impacts that's having on the environment and mm -hmm. on sustainable development. So those are also um, ongoing. Um, that's an ongoing an ongoing case, case yeah. yeah. Um, because that area where, where they're mostly fighting for is, is where most of South Africa's coal is being mined. It's, it's the province of Umpumalanga, where, you know, obviously we do need electricity, which is um, development, but also uh, the, the people then need, you know, clean air. So uh, that's like um, directly, um, you know, part of um, 
sustainable development versus you know the constitution like uh, what gets priority so yeah mm -hmm. Um, yes, another question there, and one up here. After that. Um, thank you for the film, it was great. And I have a question regarding, because it looked from the film, and I don't know about the other experiences that you have studied, but it seemed as, the, as if there was a sort of collaboration or peaceful relationship between municipalities uh, and waste speakers in the sense that they were assisting the function only just not properly benefiting from the environmental gain. And I was thinking about uh, a case when I was uh, practicing a lawyer in, in, in Chile where a person who owed a land and that land was being rented by the municipality to have a landfill, they were sanctioned because waste pickers uh, would come into this landfill mm -hmm. um, and that was not allowed. So from what I could see, there was sort of like animosity between the managers of landfills, of proper landfills in Chile and waste pickers. Uh, and I was wondering, because it didn't come up at least on the film, mm -hmm. if there's an aspect of their job that has entails a risk of breaching law or illegality or being sanctioned, and yeah. if there is some sort of animosity as well. Yeah, that, that's a huge question, thank you. <laughs> and I have a question at the front here, just... That's fine, I right. have a very loud voice. <laughs> oh, okay. Hello, um, Alison. Thanks a lot uh, for the for the film. Um, really uh, um, impressive and, and very important that you raise our awareness to this uh, global challenge of waste management. Um, it links a little bit uh, to what uh, Monse was saying. You had looked at other countries beyond uh, South Africa. I think you said at some point in the documentary, Nigeria, if I remember correctly, Vietnam and Latin America. And if I recall correctly, at some point you said the situation for these waste speakers in Latin America is much better, is much more advanced. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering whether um, you could say a little bit more about that. Why do you think it's more advanced and whether... Um, this comparative approach that you have taken uh, uh, has enabled you to draw some, not lessons, but recommendations, let's say, uh, uh, for improving the, the situation of waste speakers in, in South Africa. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think we'll take those. Alison, you can. Okay. Um, so I'll answer the first question about um, the relationship between municipalities and waste speakers. It really depends on where you are. So, um, if you think so, a landfill manager uh, generally the license that he will get, he or she will get, or the company that manages the landfill does not has very sort of strict conditions, and usually one of those conditions is not to allow waste pickers onto the landfill to 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 do informal recycling. Um, so often uh, these arrangements happen in a very permissive way, so they they're not allowed to do it, but. It's kind of tolerated because of um, social economic conditions that waste pickers find themselves in. Um, and so it does depend. So in some parts of South Africa, I've seen waste pickers are absolutely excluded from the landfill. Um, in other parts, it's more, as I said, permissive. Um, there's, there's been one very famous case um, in Johannesburg where the, <laughs> where the, the um, and it was a municipal, um, arms length corporation that manages the, their their measures their landfills um, took a, tried to evict waste pickers from the landfill using housing law eviction laws um, to do that um, and eventually the waste pickers won on the basis that they have no other option for work um, this is their livelihood and so um, yeah, so that, so they won that case on that basis, but strictly speaking, they you know they shouldn't be there in the first place. So that does create automatically a, a, an environment in which um, conflict can thrive 
Now, what's really interesting <laughs> is that because um, the industry has seen that waste pickers work on the landfill, they have now put their infrastructure on the landfill to collect waste. So there are lots of landfills where you go and there'll be skips from all of the big um, recycling companies just there waiting, you know, they will work with the, the collectors um, to, they might give them, um, you know, there might be skips, there might be, I remember I went to one landfill that had containers on them, they had offices in the containers, it looks, so it looks very kind of, and it was very organized. Um, but it really does depend. And, and in that situation, obviously, there was a permissive um, kind of attitude from the landfill manager towards this economic um, relation, these types of economic relationships happening. But in other places, it's absolutely not allowed. It really does depend on, on where you are. Um, to answer the next question about Latin America and why they're more advanced, I think because they've been organizing for longer um, would be the simple, simple answer. Um, so in some places I can think of Colombia in Brazil, um, waste pickers are at the point where they're, they're quite so formalized that they're bidding um, for um, contracts with the municipality and with the national government. Now, this is beginning to emerge in South Africa, but remember, <laughs> South Africa only became a democracy in 1994. So in terms of, or, you know, collect the, the capacity for collective organizing, um, the, the, you know, it, they're just at a different level. Um, so I guess in, in that sense, they are catching up. So a lot of the, I was speaking earlier about the waste picking networks around the world. Um, a lot of, there's a lot of learnings that happen that happens between these organizations. So I remember I met a waste picker who, um, you know, met, where was that, in Cape Town. She had been to Bogota to meet people in Bogota to see how they were organizing. So there is this happening at some level, but I think for it to become at the same level as Latin America, it will take some time. And there's lots of reasons for that, which I um, won't go into here, but yeah, I think it's time really. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Um, uh, Trisha and Pramila, um, anything you want to come in on those questions? One um, about conflict and one about, um, uh, yeah, Latin America and uh, South Africa comparisons. So um, I'd like to respond about um, the Latin America um, situation. When Alison first approached me to work with her on this film, um, one of the first things that came to my mind was a documentary I saw, I'm not sure when I saw it, but it was about Curitiba and in Brazil and about the um, waste management initiatives going on in the city and how the city had managed to really motivate um, the citizens to see the value in waste and to see the value in keeping waste out of landfills. And apparently they have around a 70% recycling rate um, and so I think that's a really good um, case study to look at and to see how, you know, they, they brought on people. And they also um, did projects which are also happening in Johannesburg and Cape Town, where pe um, people who really needed food um, would be able to come in and bring in recyclable waste in exchange for food baskets for fresh vegetables and other um, food supplies. So I think... Um, it, it is, you know, the, there are places like that, I think, that are really worth looking at. That was just one of the things I wanted to, to mention. And I think go back to any further questions. Yeah, we can do another round of questions. Um, another one there, no worries. Sorry, just um, it gives a little food for thoughts. And again, like, congratulations. It's very interesting, the content is beautifully shot and it said so big congratulations on that. I was just wondering if you've found in your research or you think that there's room for litigation against the government um, with the help of the NGO to bring maybe a public law for an action for the breach of constitutional right? And, or do you think this is not possible due to, let's say, sustainable developments, whiteness and vagueness or other you know, obstacles and access to justice, like the cost of litigation and so on and so forth. Uh, 
Uh, thank you and, and thanks, Alison. Really wonderful. Um, I've got a question about, you know, how did you as a, a legal scholar come to make a documentary? You know, Eloise kind of alluded to the fact that this is not something that we in this faculty do mm -hmm. every day or every year. So how is it that you came to think this is the medium through which to tell your research? Okay. Thank you, we'll take another Martin. one or question. Um, maybe one more. Yeah, we'll take one more now. Um, uh, Eloise, yeah. I think this works, Emma. I've got one. Um, thank you so much, Alison. I mean, I just say on behalf of the centre, I've got my co-director here, Gracia. I'm so thrilled that we've had a film premiere, as I mentioned at the beginning. Just one, and just brilliant. And congratulations to Pramila and Tricia for the incredible work. And so lovely to have you joining us this evening. Um, as you know, I'm a big Waste Law fan, Alison. <laughs> um, and I wanted, I, I just wanted to have one question about the kind of <coughs> environmental protection mm -hmm. angle. It's interesting, we've chatted a lot about mm -hmm. the economic story mm -hmm. that we've seen, which yeah. was, you know, mm -hmm. I think very intense and well told. Mm -hmm. um, you finished the documentary by talking about your ambition or mm -hmm. hope that mm -hmm. that paradox mm -hmm. that is there in waste policy, mm -hmm. that waste would cease to exist. Mm -hmm. And that's what's always paradoxical about it as a policy field, and causes all the complexity around the definition of waste <laughs> and how to interpret it. Um, but it was interesting in the documentary itself, um, the waste pickers role was seen to be a good thing for environmental protection, mm -hmm. but also a bad thing for environmental yeah. protection. And I just wondered whether you had reflections on the environmental protection element of sustainable development okay. um, as, as you were I mean, obviously in your research, but actually in, yeah. in, in producing the film, in the way that you were interacting with people, I think that would be really interesting to hear about. Thank you. Okay. Let me see if I can read my handwriting. <laughs> um, so first question about public interest litigation. So I guess technically you could bring a, a claim against, um, so under South African constitution, anybody within South Africa um, can bring a constitutional, uh, has standing to bring a constitutional um, court case. Um, and so technically that is something that can happen, but there have been so many constitutional court cases where um, there's a famous Mr. Scroot Boom uh, who gained the, you know, used the right to housing um, this constitutional right, brought a case against the government, won her right, and then died before she could get her house because the government didn't have the capacity to get around to doing it, right? So there, there's all sorts of practical reasons around, you know, if you bring a public interest litigation um, case, you rightly mentioned the costs involved. Is that cost better used, that, that amount of money better used to train waste pickers on different skills that may or may not be related to waste? You know, is it better to help them get gain access to a job that they'd rather do than work as a waste picker? So I mean there's so as lawyers we want to litigate, right? If you're if you're that kind of if you're interested in litigation. Um, and it's where we go, but it may not, you know, for these people be the necessarily the best way forward. Um, but it is possible. So, I mean, as I mentioned, there was a famous court case that happened a few years ago. You know, in certain circumstances, litigation is really, really helpful. But because this is a systemic problem across South Africa, and I think as Trisha mentioned, half of, um, roughly half of all waste pickers are not legal, then there's a limit to how, how much litigation will actually help everyone that works in that sector. Um, but it's a very good point, very good question. How did I come to do a documentary? That's a very good question. Um, so I guess when I was doing my field work, I was told by many people in the sector, well, we, wanna, we want you to produce something that we can use. We want to know what your findings are. Um, and it needs to be in a medium that waste pickers can access. So many people, sadly don't read and write English to a level that, you know, where I could sort of write something and they can go, okay, great, this is what Alison has found. Um, two, they may not also have the time. Um, three, 
you know, getting it to them is also potentially a problem. So then I started thinking about ways that I could do that. So I thought, oh, I'll do a little video, you know, a five minute video. <laughs> and, but it'll just be me talking, right? But then we'll have to translate it into something like another language and so on. And, you know, it may not give a really nuanced, sto tell a nuanced story of the whole picture around race management. Um, and I'd seen, you know, the documentary film is one way of telling a story. Um, that is accessible to lots of different audiences. And uh, then I decided, oh, maybe I could do that. <laughs> so that's kind of how I came around to doing that. Yes, it's unusual for lawyers, um, but you know, lawyers don't necessarily need to fix a particular box. You can do things outside of the box. Um, and there are actually lawyers who do documentary filmmaking. So I'm not in, the, in this regard, I'm not the first one. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. Um, and then the final question about the, yeah, the environmental protection element of sustainable development. So yeah, very good question in terms of that's something I reflected a, a, a lot on. So I remember seeing going, uh, we went to this particular park that ended up in, in the film. Um, and here were people sorting and then they like just throw stuff in there. You know, or sometimes I'd interview people and they'd like throw stuff away. And I'm like, but you're a waste picker. Why are you throwing it away? You should be <laughs> taking it back to your <laughs> wherever, right? But that's that, that's kind of, I guess, hu part of human nature. Um, and one of the things that uh, Zuelatini Sono, so I don't know if you figured out, he's actually a lawyer himself. So that's why he's able to kind of talk about the constitution and so on. Um, one, one thing that his organization does is work on hygiene. So... Um, helping waste pickers to sort in a way that doesn't create environmental damage or like doesn't pollute the environment. Um, but it is a big issue in terms of, it's not something I thought about because it's very, you know, academics and people who want to kind of um, amplify the story of waste pickers and talk in a positive way about their, the benefits of the environment. Um, you know, very easily can look at the numbers, look at the landfill space and the airspace and, you know, how much it's contributing to the economy. But this is one part of the narrative that often gets left out, but it's a very important narrative. And, and so there are organizations that are working with it uh, along um, to help that, to change that, that um, dynamic. So I think they're called um, WCCA. Um, they they do training on that, um, but yeah, it is a it is a big issue that I I don't know how to how to solve it. I think you know eventually uh, you know hopefully it will become mainstream um, in terms of uh, raising awareness around what waste pickers um, should be doing. I guess with respect to sustainable development specifically. Um, yeah, I started with the premise that what waste pickers are doing is good for the environment. And so the harder story to tell was around economic and social um, issues. Um, but yeah, I fully, I fully now understand and see this, this aspect of it that I think, you know, I might explore more in the future around um, environmental protection. So thank you for that question. Uh, Trisha, um... And <clears throat> Pramila, did you want to come in on any of those questions? There were, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the second one first, obviously uh, we are happy Edison chose a uh, film uh, as a way to, uh, to uh, drive a thesis forward. You know, we're always happy to uh, collaborate because it also like helps us le learn, uh, you know, uh, new, about new sectors, you know, that, you know, affect our lives, but you know, actually pay attention to. So uh, it was great. Uh, working on this and, you know, just um, learning about, you know, all the things we, we can recycle because I wasn't someone who actually recycles myself. Uh, so we're always happy to help um, academics, um, you know, speak to ordinary people, you know, like, um, I hope we simplified it enough for, um, you know, ordinary people on the streets as well, just to um, be able to address the concept and actually like take it in and, you um, have it as part of part of their daily lives as well. Um, so yeah. Um, the first question, I'm actually confused. Um, I think it was about integration, um, the possibilities of uh, in integration into formal systems. Um, 
I'm not sure about that uh, because obviously um, it, it requires a lot of um, regulations, um, a lot of you know, you know, gov government departments actually needing to um, you know, work and, and do things. So that might be, might be hard, but um, while we're editing in the, in the past week, um, we did come across like two cases where, where um, reclaimers were like fighting for their rights. And um, as Alison mentioned, using the, the housing clauses, you know, um, the right to access housing um, as part of their, um, uh, part, part of their court cases. And uh, what, what they won in, in both of those cases, especially um, even though they were fighting against privately owned land that was for uh, other developments, they actually won um, against the city to uh, be relocated and provided housing where they could still uh, do their waste reclaiming. So uh, I think that's important to, uh, to uh, note, you know, and uh, there are systems in the um, there are clauses in the constitution that we can use, you know, to have fight for, um, fight for our rights and uh, actually possibly win every now and then. It's, it's, it's rare, but it happens. You know? yeah. Yeah. And I definitely think um, I'd just like to say the challenge of trying to make, you know, this academic information accessible. Um, it was really exciting when Alison was here in South Africa, we did a screening and we showed um, the waste pickers who are in the film. Um, we, we did a screening right where they live so that they'd be able to, uh, you know, have easy access to the screening and got feedback on that. And then we did actually incorporate their feedback into this um, longer version. So the first version we showed, we actually edited it in about two days um, because Alison was here for a short period. So we spent that time shooting and then quickly editing. And um, I think, you know, it, it is really possible to take, you know, complicated legal concepts and make them, you know, accessible to a really wide audience. and. Um, it does create, it does take some imagination, but also I think what's really important when you make a film to do it in a non-extractive way, um, a, a collaborative way, where you, you really try to um, give the participants who you're working with a voice, um, give them um, space to, you know, to process the information, to respond and um, to share authentic responses. So I'm really happy that um, I think we were able to do that and we were able to you know, to see um, like real moments of real life within the film mm -hmm. that help you to really connect to those personal narratives. So um, thanks very much, Alison, for the opportunity. And, you know, I really hope that um, you, that you making this film inspires other academics to also mm -hmm. take their research and findings just off the paper and into um, more accessible mediums. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. I think, um, yeah, for those of us who are academics and researchers, it really has um, uh, pushes us to make our um, findings more accessible. I think um, that's a really good point to close on. Um, thank you, Alison, and thank you, Pramila and Trisha. I think it's been uh, such an enjoyable experience watching the movie, learning a lot about the struggles of um, <coughs> uh, reclaimers in South Africa and their um, uh, struggles for getting their rights recognized. Um, uh, the policy document, I think, is floating around as well outside, outside. Uh, so please take a take a look at that um, and uh, yeah we have another hand of uh, round of applause for um, Pramila <laughs>